Hi there, and welcome to another one of my video Bible lessons. We're continuing our series in establishing a prosperous soul. This one is part two. And we're going to start with 3 John, verse 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. God doesn't just want you to, to be healed. He wants you and I to walk in health. So there's a difference between living in a prosperous financial condition and walking in health versus just being healed and getting by. The difference is if our soul is prospering. Our consistent prosperity and health are contingent upon our soul prospering. It's God's will for us to prosper. The word, that word prosper and be in health is different from needing fi a financial blessing or needing healing. It's, it's a condition of life where you're walking in prosperity and walking in health. So when I'm talking about soul prosperity, I'm not saying that someone has a perfect prosperous soul in order to receive a healing or receive a blessing. But if you want to live it constantly in a prosperous life, you have a responsibility and you have grace. How many of you have known a Christian that didn't act like one? You couldn't tell it. Their soul wasn't prospering. You could tell it. Their soul wasn't prospering and they're full of drama, full of strife and misunderstandings. Bottom line is, I'm not judging whether or not they're saved, but their soul isn't prospering. If drama and misunderstanding are the order of the day in the relationship, then personal agenda and control is the issue. You, ha How you leave a place is exactly how you'll enter the next. Material prosperity and health <coughs> affect us all and are the fruit of a byproduct of a prosperous soul. And if you're constantly having problems in your finances or in health, you need to check the condition of your soul. In your church, if, if you have a con constant downturn in your finances, and it's always almost always because there's a strife in the leadership, you need to watch and look for that. Because the soul of that organization isn't prospering. Unity is strictly a leadership issue. Psalm 23, <laughs> Psalm, Psalm 33, Psalm 30, 133, Psalm 133, verses 1 and 2. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious soil upon the head, running down the beard of Aaron. The beard of Aaron running down the edge of his garments. So the head is Jesus, and the head is also whoever is in an organization of that ministry. The beard is a type of maturity. Financial blessing and divine health are in direct proportion to, some de to the same degree that our soul is prospering. The majority of Christian problems are related to the failure of keeping our souls well. The reasons are because they believe lies about themselves or about God and about others. Or they've not yielded to the Lord in their emotions or their will. A prosperous soul is not only having your mind renewed, but it's having your will emotions yielded to God. It means you trust God even when things don't make sense to us.
Proverbs 22, verse 5. That's Proverbs 22, verse 5. <coughs> Pardon me. Thorns and snares are the, are the way of the perverse. He who guards his soul will be far from it. So how many would like to be far from thorns and snares? You got to guard your soul. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. So why would we have to guard it? To keep it from stuff that shouldn't latch on in your mind and in your heart. A soul that is cluttered with fear, anger, unforgiveness, bitter and anxiety, lust and greed and pride. It crowds Jesus and his life out of you. The word issues in the Hebrew means borders or boundaries. So to keep your heart with all diligence, because out of your heart, and if your soul isn't lined up with the spirit, it can become a barrier and limits the life of your, from your spirit. And it will limit you based on what you let in. So what is it that constitutes a prosperous soul one coming to jesus for rest get into his presence and apprehend his heart if all your relationship with god is get something in your hand that's immature we sh we should want to know him face to face we have the peace that surpasses all understanding and guards our mind Philippians 4 6. Philippians 4 6. Be anxious for nothing and everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So we need to shut the door on the wrong things and start worshiping God with the right things. Too many times we don't do that. And nobody can cast your cares upon the Lord any more than someone can eat food for you. Two is removing judgments. Matthew 7, verse 1, 2, 5. Judge not that you, will sh that you should be judged. For what, what judgment you judge, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So this is powerful. It's, it's a powerful passage of scripture. When you read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. So that, that was one of the most in-depth recorded teachings of Jesus. And he's talking to his disciples about how to make disciples. And as, um, and as he's talking about how to develop character. Matthew 5 deals with the sins and temptations of young Christians. Lusting, divorcing, anger. Then Matthew 6 deals with the sins and temptations of adolescent Christians doing the right thing, praying, fasting, and giving for the wrong reasons to be seen by men. And Matthew 7 deals with the sins of more mature Christians. Judging people's motives, a log or a beam in the eye isn't really realistic analogy. So how many have had a speck in their eye? It hurts. It is possible to, is it possible to get a log in your eye? No. So he couldn't be talking about a physical eye. What eye is he talking about then? <clears throat> Matthew 6, 22 and 23.
The lamp of your body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. Therefore, the light that is in you is darkness. And how great is that darkness? So he's talking about, is he talking about the physical eye? No, he's talking about your heart. Specifically, what part of your heart? He's talking about your soul. Because your spirit, if you're born again, is not going to have a bad eye. The light or life of your physical body is according to the life that's in your soul. The light and life from your spirit, man, to the body must come through the soul. And that's the only way the light from your spirit to your physical body is through the soul. He's telling you here that if that's, um, that if that's in your soul, uh, if what's in your soul is darkness, how great is that darkness? Because it's going to hinder the light that's in your spirit manifesting out. And what allows light and life from your spirit, man, to affect your body in the physical realm is your soul. Likewise, what conceals and covers the light from your light, light and life from your spirit and keeps it from affecting your body in the physical realm is also your soul. If your soul lines up with your spirit, then your body will be full of light. The condition of your soul determines whether God's light gets through to the physical realm. And the key to the wholeness and soundness and the health of your body is then relative, is the relative wholeness of your soul. In Matthew 7, a log in the eye is a picture of a log jam that can be built up in your souls through judgment. And it gets cut off and restricts the flow of life from the, the spiritual realm. Judgments hinder and re, and release, uh, hinder the release of salvation and its benefits. And those who tolerate judgments in their souls stop the flow of salvation and benefits in their lives. Hebrews 10, verse 30. That's Hebrews 10, 30. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Again, the Lord will judge will judge his people. So who will judge the, his people? The Lord. Whenever we tolerate judgment of others, we assume God's pl place. And the reason why we're not called to, be, to judge is because none of us are objective enough to judge right, righteously or fairly. You don't know people's heart like God does. We can judge actions and statements that people make or do in light of the word, but it's not our place to judge the motive of why they did it or pass on a sentence onto them. You don't know why they did it or what they did. You can judge what they did, but you can't judge why they did it. Instead of trying to pass judgment on the people, pray for them. Judge means sentence, condemn, punish, or avenge. If you don't have any, if you don't have the authority, you don't have the wisdom to judge in that situation. Matthew 7, verse 5. We'll read it again. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. If you don't get judgments out of your own heart, you're not going to see clearly. You'll be judging them after the flesh, and you can't help them. So that is my lesson. Hope it's blessed you so far.